Good afternoon, everybody. This is Extreme Meteorologist Reed Timmer with a lot to talk about uh, this live severe weather briefing with dual enhanced risks in place by the Storm Prediction Center uh, for different areas uh, through the North Country. And it looks like it's going to be a late show for both of them, especially for that enhanced risk that uh, straddles the uh, North Dakota, South Dakota border. Uh, that looks like a very late show, more of an MCS type of a, a feature moving through late tonight. Uh, and that's going to be uh, developing in southeastern Montana, likely to the west of the Broadus area, uh, between uh, Billings and Broadus, probably off of the Custer Gallatin National Forest there, that little elevated terrain just to the west of Broadus. And this is mostly in a post-frontal environment here that's behind the main surface low. Uh, northerly winds are going to switch around to a bit, bit northeasterly. Uh, in response to another uh, uh, jet streak that's going to eject from the northern Rockies later on tonight. And that's going to br bring with it a uh, big time mesoscale convective system, MCS, wind bag, uh, whatever you want to call it. But it's going to be coming out late tonight, probably as a bow echo, moving right uh, just to the south of the Black Hills and uh, straddling the South Dakota, North Dakota border. And in fact, that's actually southwestern uh, North Dakota there. Uh, it's going to actually pass to the north of the Black Hills and uh, straddle that North Dakota, South Dakota border. Uh, but this is the other zone that we're watching, the enhanced risk of, across northern Minnesota. And I think that the greatest likelihood for supercells and uh, severe weather is across the far northern portion of that risk, including the woods there of southeastern Manitoba and the southwestern Ontario. And uh, it's possible some models are showing th those storms to backbuild down the line as we get a little bit closer to sunset and overnight. And uh, there is a low-level jet that's going to develop uh, later on this evening. Uh, the energy in both these locations is arriving just a little bit late. So the timing isn't perfect for a more substantial severe weather event that occurs during the daytime hours. Uh, but there is going to be a late arrival of the fringe of that up upper level system across northern Minnesota. There's a warm front that right now is lifting northward through central Minnesota. That's going to arrive up here in the north country by this evening. Uh, there is a front uh, that's also moving to the southeast, uh, Pacific front uh, that's going to uh, provide some low-level convergence uh, that could be enough for these storms to break through a capping inversion, bust through that cap, and then become pretty substantial severe weather uh, producers. Maybe even isolated tornado up here in the northern Minnesota target. Uh, the tornado threat, though, for this enhanced risk uh, late tonight, uh, straddling the North Dakota-South Dakota border, very minimal tornado threat. That's more of a wind uh, producer late night tonight. So we're just going to cut straight to the chase here and I'm going to show you a couple different models and uh, their convective evolution. Normally we start with the upper levels of the atmosphere and work our way down to the surface, look at the real observations as well, uh, then look at the short range models last to see what their convective uh, scenarios are. Uh, we never want to get too focused on the, uh, the radar reflectivity forecast of the HRRR, for example. We want to analyze the environments, uh, the ingredients, that uh, meteorological ingredients that come together for this severe weather, and try to turn these uh, briefings into a little bit more of a learning process so you guys can forecast uh, severe weather on your own. I know that we're well on our way to, to getting there. Many of you are already there doing your own forecasts of severe weather. But this is the NAM model. This is the, uh, the regular NAM, so not the incredible resolution of some of the other models, uh, but still a, a good model to, that, that you're very well familiar with the biases. It could be a very useful model. This is the forecast at about 10 p.m. this evening, so this is well after sunset. Uh, the NAM shows a, a couple of uh, mature storms, likely supercells up there near the International Falls or Boundary Waters area, far southwestern Ontario. And it also hints at a little bit of convection building south into the enhanced risk area late. And uh, the NAM also shows the development of this MCS, some initial convection here, uh, southeastern Wyoming, just to the east, or southeastern Montana, to the east of the Billings area. And this is the initial uh, sign of that MCS that's going to move east-southeast across the region. And it looks like I have not yet uh, changed slides. There you go. There's the latest NAM. And... Um, this is the NAM forecast for 10 p.m. tonight, and you can see it has some mature uh, severe weather up near International Falls or the Boundary Waters area, far southwestern Ontario. A lot of woods, lakes up there, probably a lot of mosquitoes as well. And the NAM even hints at some initiation uh, down southwest into the enhanced risk area near or just after sunset. Some of the other models are a little bit more aggressive 
with developing uh, that convection further south into Minnesota as we get closer to sunset. The NAM is the least aggressive of those. And it also shows this MCS developing just to the east of the Billings area, uh, moving east-southeast uh, through the Custer Gallatin National Forest, eventually toward the Broadus area, passing to the north of the Black Hills uh, and straddling uh, that South Dakota, uh, North Dakota border. That's where the enhanced risk is in, in effect. And that's going to be late tonight. And uh, that was at 10 p.m. This is at about midnight, still showing that convection pushing east through the far north country of Minnesota, attempting to build further south uh, in, into that instability as well, into further south into northern Minnesota. And it begins to show this MCS really mature near the broadest area, uh, moving into to southwestern uh, uh, North Dakota Lake. But this is at midnight, closing in on that uh, North Dakota, South Dakota border. And then stepping forward with time, this is just after midnight. We're talking at the very late night hours uh, right here with this one, that MCS getting a little bit closer to the Dickinson area, closing in on Bidmark, Bismarck at about 2 or 3 in the morning, uh, producing some big time wind likely. Uh, likely a bow echo will be happening here with widespread wind damage moving east along the uh, North Dakota, South Dakota border. This line of storms becomes a complex as it approaches the Minnesota Arrowhead, eventually arriving near the Duluth area uh, by about daybreak. And uh, still the MCS charging forward along the I-94 corridor, uh, likely approaching the Jamestown area uh, by about daybreak at about 7 a.m. That's what this time is, 7 a.m. on Friday. And this MCS is going to be a player for northern and central Minnesota severe weather on Friday, where there could even be an enhanced risk eventually issued up there. Uh, but the evolution of this uh, complex of storms tomorrow morning is definitely going to decide where that severe weather sets up uh, on, uh, during the day on Friday. But it looks like it could even be a more widespread severe weather event, timed a little bit better to have daytime severe weather in central and northern Minnesota. The NAM has a broken line of severe storms, uh, back building, unzipping down the line all the way through western Minnesota, eventually into southeastern South Dakota, far northeastern Nebraska on Friday, late afternoon. And these could be some tornado producers. Right now, the Storm Prediction Center has a 5% tornado risk across central Minnesota. There is a decent chance I'll be heading that way early tomorrow morning, uh, considering taking a flight uh, into this zone. This is on Friday evening. It even has that line back building down into eastern Nebraska, uh, down toward the Omaha area, potentially uh, by Friday early evening, with a squall line marching east through just about the entire state of Minnesota, eventually approaching the Minneapolis-St. Paul area uh, by Friday evening. But that's the uh, convective evolution of the, uh, of the NAM model. And uh, let's see what some of the higher resolution models uh, also show. So this is the uh, forecast for 0Z or 7 p.m. this evening. And this is the HRRR model, everybody's favorite. And this is a forecast for 7 p.m. this evening. So we're starting all over again. Uh, the HRRR hints at convective initiation across the northwestern corner of Minnesota, pretty close to the southeastern corner of Manitoba as well. And... Uh, Real similar, actually, to the NAM evolution. Uh, a little bit earlier, though, with the convective initiation. And I'm betting that this, uh, these enhanced risks uh, issued by the Stone Prediction Center are largely correlated with the HRRR. This is at 3Z, 10 p.m. Uh, shows some mature, severe weather into southwestern Ontario, uh, near the Boundary Waters, Minnesota area, uh, down near International Falls. And uh, this is at 10 p.m., and you can see a couple post-frontal storms there across southwestern Manitoba. Going a little bit further in advance, getting a little bit closer uh, to the middle of the night, the HRRR, <clears throat> by about midnight, has that MCS much further east than the NAM. Uh, so the HRRR model initiates that MCS well into the Dakotas, but still the same latitudinal position right along that South Dakota, North Dakota border. Uh, that's at about midnight. This is midnight. And the HRRR actually does not have any storms building south into central uh, Minnesota. And actually most models have a large portion of, uh, of northern Minnesota and a large part of that enhanced risk actually pretty free and void of convection. But it does have this pretty large MCS moving through southwestern Ontario near the international border. It also has this MCS charging east 
uh, near the Dickinson area, maybe a little bit south of Dickinson by about midnight, stepping forward another three hours to 3 a.m. It finally has this MCS beginning to wash out. The NAM, though, had the MCS continuing all the way through eastern uh, North Dakota, eventually lifting up toward the Grand Forks area. Let's uh, step forward now to daybreak on Friday. And in fact, the HRRR also has that MCS reinvigorating near the I-94 corridor on approach to Fargo by daybreak tomorrow. It's a little bit faster with the uh, Northern, North Country MCS. Uh, it has that MCS well over Lake Superior, Western Lake Superior by daybreak, whereas the NAM has it a little bit slower, uh, closer to the Duluth area by daybreak tomorrow. Uh, but this MCS is going to be a big player on whether northern Minnesota uh, sees significant severe weather or not during the day tomorrow. Uh, there is a 5% risk for tornadoes on the south flank of this uh, complex of storms, uh, where additional severe weather is expected to, to develop by peak heating on Friday, extending off to the south. But the timing of this MCS is not necessarily ideal. That's a bit of an early arrival of that MCS. And geez, the man, I wonder if it even has storms back building. There it is. And the HRRR blows out a big time squall line with most of the shear lifting off into the north country of southwestern Ontario and kind of a squall line unzipping down the line all the way down into eastern Nebraska uh, by tomorrow evening. But this looks like more of a squall line situation, not necessarily the most ideal. Uh, for tornado production. The NAM has a little bit less of a progressive solution and actually has a broken line of supercells developing uh, by late afternoon tomorrow. Um, we can also look at some of the other models, the three kilometer NAM. Three kilometer NAM also has a monster squall line from the Minnesota Arrowhead by tomorrow at about 7 p.m. extending southwest all the way down uh, to the Omaha area. So I suspect there's going to be a ton of mega shelf uh, type footage uh, coming in from the area uh, tomorrow. I have a lot, big mega shelf probably covering the whole entire state of Minnesota. But if the Zero Z models tonight look a little bit more favorable for a tornado potential, then I'll probably be up there. I'll fly into Minnesota first flight tomorrow, uh, rent a car, blow it apart somewhere across the north country of Minnesota. So this is the forecast for this evening. Uh, this is the three kilometer NAM, a little bit higher resolution version of the NAM. And uh, this uh, three kilometer NAM is a bit more aggressive with storms developing across northwestern Minnesota. You don't want to focus too much on the storm mode as depicted by the, uh, the three kilometer NAM as it's not really a convective allowing model. But it gives you a good idea kind of of the extent of convection. And look at this, the three kilometer NAM blows up a monster MCS across the entire uh, enhanced risk across the northwestern northern portion of Minnesota. It starts to have that uh, MCS develop across eastern Montana there as well. But dang, look at this. By tonight, it has a monster squall line, maybe a potential derecho uh, closing in on the Minneapolis area. This is by uh, midnight tonight. So by midnight tonight, there's a possibility that this line of storms could develop all the way down into that capping inversion. The three kilometer NAM has a big bow echo too coming in late tonight. The timing of that is actually pretty consistent amongst the models. Uh, even by tomorrow morning, having it move into eastern North Dakota, uh, the three kilometer NAM completely washes out the squall line after blasting through Minneapolis late, late night tonight. So the biggest discrepancies amongst the models are for this northern Minnesota mode. And I'm going to show you why now why that's uh why there's so much model discrepancy with that zone now let's look at satellite imagery here quick uh peek at satellite this is the current satellite and you've got a lot of stratiform clouds here across northern minnesota that's to the north of this warm front that is lifting to the north uh, ahead of that large scale upper level system that's dominating western canada so this warm front continues to push north uh, these stratiform clouds here will erode as we go through the afternoon, and eventually this warm front should position somewhere across the Minnesota Arrowhead uh, from the northwestern corner of Minnesota. Looks like we have a bit of a complex of storms uh, ongoing here across northeastern North Dakota. This is where the surface low is located, and it's kind of a broad surface low. Northerly winds back behind it, and eventually that complex of storms is going to straddle the South Dakota-North Dakota border as those northerlies 
northerly shift back to more of an easterly direction tonight. But that uh, uh, line of storms is going to be elevated in nature, elevated over that shallow uh, stable layer that is uh, uh, in place back behind uh, that surface low. Let's look at a quick surface map here showing this configuration. Surface map shows the warm front very well on this map. Uh, there is that warm front. Temperatures to the south of it warming through the mid 80s, low to mid 80s. Temperatures to the north are in the low 70s, even the upper 60s in spots here across the uh, Minnesota Arrowhead. Perfect for mosquitoes up there or that stratiform deck lifting off to the north. And uh, this warm front is going to continue progressing northward and will accelerate as we get a little bit closer to evening. And uh, that's as a low level jet or a southerly wind at about a kilometer above the ground develops and helps to lift that warm front northward just ahead of convective initiation. Most of the models initiate storms at around 0Z in northwestern Minnesota. That's where the 3 kilometer NAM initiates it. Other models, though, keep that mature convection into southwestern Ontario, uh, maybe into the far northern portion of, uh, of Minnesota. Here you can see where that surface low is located back in uh, eastern North Dakota with those northerlies on the back side of that surface low, easterlies on the north side. Uh, some elevated thunderstorms as well, northeastern North Dakota into southern Manitoba. Those should gradually lift off to the northeast. Uh, maybe the southern flank of those could intensify as they move through far northern Minnesota. So that's the uh, basic surface map. Uh, really, this warm front will have to lift north to northern Minnesota. And once that happens near evening, that's when the energy begins to bleed into the zone. And we should start to see... Uh, some storms develop. There's some low-level convergence as well at around that time. Kind of going backwards a little bit in this briefing, working our way up to the upper levels now. This is a 500 millibar map uh, this morning. And uh, this is the main trough that's been dominating Western Canada for a long time now. It led to that substantial tornado in southwestern Manitoba. Big severe weather day a couple days ago in southern Alberta where Mark was deploying our hail sensor. Then another pretty big severe weather day across southeastern Saskatchewan yesterday that didn't materialize in terms of the tornadoes uh, because of an outflow boundary that surged to the south and stabilized the atmosphere out ahead of that convective line that developed. The evolution of storms and their interaction with each other, the complexes that they form are those MCSs that will develop and often create their own environments. That's what makes this time of year so complex to forecast severe weather and convection all the time as opposed to earlier on in the spring that convection is a lot more closely tied to the synoptic pattern uh, and here is the uh, the energy that arrives later on tonight that's going to help to develop uh, that mcs across uh, eastern eastern montana and look in the morning most of minnesota is dominated by a ridge uh, just ahead of this trough uh, but as I mentioned, the cyclonic curvature, the stronger flow at the mid and high levels, slowly starts to impinge on the enhanced risk area in northwestern uh, Minnesota and the southeastern Manitoba, southwestern Ontario. That's going to happen closer to sunset. And uh, also for the three hours after sunset, that convection is really going to get going. But that's kind of a late arrival for this upper level energy. And that's why it's not going to be a more substantial severe weather event during the daylight hours. Uh, but eventually this whole entire trough ejects to the east and it's going to bring a uh, more substantial widespread convective event tomorrow from northern Minnesota all the way down to uh, eastern Nebraska uh, tomorrow afternoon and late. And then you can still see this anticyclone hanging on. Uh, it's a little bit further east. This anticyclone is located near New Mexico, west Texas. And uh, this is just an unprecedentedly weak monsoon season, uh, one of the weakest in, in years across the southwestern U.S. I'll show you uh, a plot of uh, aerial average uh, moisture that will definitely show you, uh, put into perspective, just how inactive this monsoon season has been compared to recent years. And uh, we also are going to discuss the tropics today, but first we got to get through this. But Josephine looks like it's going to recurve and become a fish storm and counter a very hostile environment and potentially weaken. So now let's step forward about 12 hours and go down in the atmosphere, down to about a kilometer above the ground. These are the 850 millibar winds. 
that we're looking at right here. And uh, this is near zero Z. And look at that low level jet response that happens across northern Minnesota up into far southwestern Ontario. This is at zero Z this evening, so about 7 p.m. Central Time. And uh, throughout the day, this low level jet is really weak. And then finally, right at 7 p.m., it starts to crank. And that's just as that mid and upper level flow begins to move a little bit off to the east to bring that pressure gradient far enough east to excite this southerly low level jet. And that's why the parameters look so favorable across northern Minnesota, because that low level jet develops at about 7 p.m. this evening, brings with it a substantial amount of low level shear. The warm front is going to position uh, from northern Minnesota across the uh, Minnesota Arrowhead. So if this trough were just a little bit more progressive and faster than today, it would be a pretty substantial severe weather day across northern Minnesota. But the late arrival of that cyclonically curved upper level flow, the late development of the slow level jet uh, wait holding off until about 7 p.m. this evening, right about sunset. That's why most of the models show a late development of storms out there. And now we can look at a couple forecast soundings as well and show you why there's such a late development. But first, this is a zero to one kilometer energy helicity index. That's a composite index that we often show you, a composite between surface base cape and zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity. And if you look at this just by itself in a vacuum, uh, you would think there's gonna be strong tornado potential up there, uh, but you could definitely see this blob of big time low level shear. And that's because that low level jet develops late at about zero Z and that and with the Cape values of four to 5,000, there's a big Cape blob that's also slowly lifting north through the state of Minnesota. But when that low level jet develops at about 7 p.m., that really ramps up the low level wind shear as well, co-located with that Cape. But you wanna look at some soundings in this area to really get an idea if those favorable conditions for tornadoes are going to be realized. So let's look at a sounding from right in the middle of that. If I could find this photograph. So I took a sounding right in the middle of that EHI blob. Show it to you here right, right now. There it is. So this is a sounding from right in the middle of that EHI blob. And uh, you can already tell just by first glance, just having immense experience with these soundings that this one has something wrong with it. Uh, you can see this little bit of a capping inversion out there. Uh, that's probably more of a frontal inversion, maybe what's left over of the warm front as it lifts north into that blob, uh, but definitely a capping inversion that's going to act to suppress convection throughout the day. Uh, likely caused by some of that ridging that happens the first half of the day too and some subsidence uh, in that level. And you can definitely see a lot of wind shear. You can see southeasterly winds at the surface, a low level jet of about 45 knots uh, there, about a kilometer up. Uh, you have some weaker flow though, aloft at 500 uh, up to 300 millibars. And that's because of the late arrival of that cyclonically curved accelerated flow but you can see the low level jet here ramping up to about 40 knots out of the south southwest. Surface wind remains relatively weak. That's a textbook decoupled environment. As you can see here, a lot of moisture trapped below that capping inversion. But this is a great sounding for the low levels and that's why the EHIs are so through the roof, why the storm relative helicity is so substantial. You also combine that with those 70 dew points, you get a lot of cape. But then you see this and you've got some weak flow at 500 to 300 that is already giving you hints that there's a late arrival of that upper level support uh, the late arrival of the upper level support means that there's not a lot of cooling at the capping inversion level uh, there's, is a, a little bit of surface convergence as that front moves east just to the east of that surface low that could be enough to punch convection through that capping inversion and then take advantage of all this instability at the mid and high levels and that could happen in far northern Minnesota, especially really to the north of where that capping inversion is dominating. So even though this looks relatively substantial, a big time curved photograph there, you can already see some hints that there's a late arrival of that upper level support, even a little bit of veer back veer noted in there, uh, but definitely a, 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 a photograph and sounding especially the hodograph that's loaded in the low levels and that's contributing 
to that inflation of the composite indices, but you dig a little bit deeper. And one thing is that you need a storm in those environments to get tornadoes. So if there's no storm, then that environment is not going to be realized or ingested by the, uh, by the supercell, and that's going to mean that a tornado is not going to be produced. Now let's look at another model. This is the RAT model. Uh, has good agreement on where that warm front is lifting through central Minnesota. Uh, a lot of convective inhibition to the north of that warm front. That's what the blue is there, the opposite of Cape. Uh, a lot of stable air, and that's because you saw in that last sounding, there was quite a bit of a capping inversion or a frontal inversion, and uh, that frontal inversion is just dominating up there with the surface temperature is pretty cold. Uh, with a big warming just above the ground. That's what's happening to the north of this warm front. To the south of it, you get an erosion of that uh, frontal inversion, and uh, that is, allows for the lack of a capping inversion. Uh, but there's not a lot of surface convergence down here. In fact, there's not even a lot of surface convergence in eastern South Dakota right now. You've got southerlies and then finally some weak westerlies down here. But look at this Cape Blob organizing, even with uh, northerly surface winds that's behind the surface low still plenty of moisture back behind that front and that blob of instability is going to be the seed uh, for this complex of storms that will initiate across southeastern Montana and then move into this environment of increasing instability probably peaking near the Dickinson area uh, likely impacting Bismarck and many of the models have it reinvigorating by tomorrow morning across southeastern North Dakota and the evolution and extent that this MCS dominates tonight is going to modulate the severe weather tomorrow across central and northern Minnesota. So now let's step forward to evening in the RAT model and see what it does. It focuses the uh, instability axis across northwestern Minnesota, lifts the warm front, washes it out just a little bit, but lifts the warm front pretty close to the international border as we discussed. And there is a little bit of surface convergence. You can see weak westerly winds. And they are weak, so the, the convergence is not substantial uh, there in the back, uh, right along that front. And just ahead of the front, you kind of have weak south-southwesterly winds. So there's not a ton of convergence there, but this may be just enough uh, to fire storms right near the uh, international border, uh, near this region in far northwestern Minnesota. Some of the models uh, are showing uh, a back building of those storms all the way down into central Minnesota. That's why there's a big enhanced risk out there. The three kilometer NAM is the most aggressive with that solution, bringing a squall line late tonight all the way down into the Minneapolis area. The other models though, confine the convection up near the international border and then uh, bring an MCS by tomorrow morning into the Duluth area. Uh, some of the other models are a little faster with that MCS, bringing it out over Western Lake Superior by tomorrow morning. So really, we've got two MCSs that are forecast to form. One along the South Dakota-North Dakota border late tonight. That's going to be a player for severe weather tomorrow. And then this one that develops across the north country of Minnesota, eventually passing through the Minnesota Arrowhead. And there is a lot of uncertainty as to how, how far south that complex of storms builds into central Minnesota. The SBC, though, seems to be pretty confident that those storms will backbuild all the way into central uh, Minnesota. That's why there's that enhanced risk across this area. And uh, all models show the evolution of MCS along the North Dakota-South Dakota border. And that's, of course, why there's an enhanced risk out there, mainly for windbag potential. Big time windbag materializing, and that could even impact portions of southeastern North Dakota, too, by the daybreak hours tomorrow. And one final map of the wrap shows a uh, modest increase in the low-level shear across northern Minnesota there tonight. That's in response to that low-level jet that initiates tonight. So not incredible wind shear. And the fact that that low-level shear is not tight up to the boundary, that is another artifact of the upper levels just not being timed quite right uh, for the, uh, for, with the rest of the system, with the lower levels and with the instability and with the lifting warm front. And that often happens this time of year in the middle of the summer. The waves aren't quite shaped as they usually are during peak spring months. Uh, sometimes they'll try to lift off to the north and eject over an anticyclone. But the fact that that deeper wind shear is not right up against the initiating boundary, and this is at zero Z, uh, that shows me that the convergence is not incredibly focused here. Uh, this isn't 
a largely synoptically driven system because if you had a big, strong surface low ejecting, that would bring southeasterly winds backed up right up against the initiating boundary. You'd have stronger westerlies and southwesterlies on the backside of the boundary, pr pr providing a greater surface convergence, and you'd have more upper level support. But still, these are fun to watch, these conditional setups, and uh, that's when you learn the most. Uh, that, that's also when you find out what your favorite models are, when you develop your own forecast model biases, uh, you develop your favorite models, your kind of go-to familiar forecast models. That's really how you develop them. And some models do really well this time of year in the Northern Plains. Other models do better in Dixie Alley. Other models do better with those more synoptically driven types of your weather events. Some models do better across the High Plains. The RAT model, for example, is my favorite out there. So you just got to use those tools or use these events to try to hone your own forecasting skills. And again, those dual enhanced risks with uh, my drawings all over it. Uh, but these are the two areas to watch, and it's going to be later on in the night tonight. Uh, but we'll be tracking it on the Radar Omega app. Uh, be sure to tune in uh, to that. I'll be uh, sharing some of those 3D tools as well of satellite and radar as these MCSs progress through the North Country. But two very different processes at play. The Northern Minnesota one and more of a traditional warm sector, whereas the South Dakota, North Dakota one is a little bit more in a post-frontal environment. Still, though, big impactful severe weather expected late tonight. I hope you guys enjoy my weather reports. Many more to come, and I'm trying to stick as close to daily weather briefings as possible for the Facebook supporter community. Thank you, everybody. Never stop chasing.